Table Mountain in South Africa. The Cape Peninsula is a nature paradise on man's doorstep. The massive, flat-topped mountain is home to a mere 500 baboons. Surrounded by towns and roads, these monkeys are increasingly coming into conflict with their human neighbors. Attraction or nuisance? This is the story of the Smiths Gang, one of the most notorious baboon troops in South Africa. The Smiths Gang is one of 17 baboon families living on Table Mountain. High above Smithswinkel Bay, which lent the group its name, a cave houses some 30 monkeys, among the last of their kind in the Cape Peninsula. Their forefathers were regarded solely as pests and systematically chased away, but for the past 10 years, all baboons in the Cape have been placed under strict protection laws, despite the increasing nuisance they're causing in Cape Town suburbs. Just below the baboon's cave, Mark Duffel starts his day. For the past six years, the former engineer and his wife have lived in a canvas and wood shelter near the Smiths Gang's cave. Mark is a big guy and fearless. Even the alpha male baboons respect him He's been observing the animal's habits, and his resulting knowledge and abilities are becoming ever more useful. Mark earns his living by scaring baboons. I'm not saying I'm like a baboon whisperer, but I mean, I can, I just talk to them and that, and um, when they look back at me or their signs that they give back to me, I, I can interpret it. I might be totally wrong, but I mean, I work fairly well with the baboons, so yeah. Not far from his hut, Mark has installed a motion sensor triggered camera. It takes snaps around the clock whenever animals move across the lens. The photos give Mark vital information about numbers and other changes in the Smiths Gang group that he lives with. These baboons have largely lost their fear of human beings, a dangerous trend. The biggest troublemakers are the alpha males. These animals are widely known, their ears visibly tagged, and they're equipped with radio transmitters. The list of their misdemeanors, in a human context, would make up a sizable criminal record. This is Jimmy, a burglar and a loner. Long-fingered Fred, famous for breaking into cars. And Merlin, he prefers to target restaurants. Ruffians like this can't be left on their own. Esme Beamish is a researcher at the University of Cape Town. Her antennae can track the baboons even in thick bush, as the hoodlums amongst them all wear collars that emit signals. The baboon family's territory covers several square kilometers, and they're not easy to find. Fred, Merlin, and Jimmy also strike out on their own and can wind up far from the group. All the data gathered by the biologist is designed to help set up a management plan for these simian repeat offenders. We're trying to understand where the baboons live. We've tried to look at their home ranges. We try and understand um, what causes their mortality. Is it motor car vehicles or is it uh, people shooting them? 
And then we've tried to look at uh, what people are actually doing to them. The Smiths gang lives in an extended family. As usual for baboons, the males and females live together with their offspring in their shelter. The strongest males call the shots. The groups have a strict hierarchy and form close social relationships. They are chakma baboons, the largest of the species. Standing upright, they can reach just under 1.5 meters and weigh up to 30 kilograms. A typical feature is their long, shaggy coat. And the males have snouts similar to a dog's. Civilization is literally getting into the baboon's hair. There are around three million people living around the Cape Peninsula mountain massif. Houses and roads in the baboon's territory are tempting. As the baboons are so strictly protected, they have almost nothing to fear from human beings. Everything seems to have been specially created for them. Monkeys are extremely playful. <laughs> Curiosity and trial and error pay off and their forays are generally full of pleasant surprises. Gangster Jimmy will do almost anything for a tasty tidbit. The greedy thief gets up close to humans. Too close, according to some. Mark Duffel's air gun with its plastic bullets is not designed to kill. To put these pests in their place, tactics are needed that the monkeys will understand. Punishment. With his loud weapon, the man from the bush is the alpha male feared most by the Smiths gang. Jimmy steals wherever he can. Nothing will stop him. As a juvenile, he learned how to climb buildings and break into kitchens. His cronies copied him, and to this day they regularly organize raiding parties on blocks of flats. They'll cheerfully run the risks of breaking and entering for a quick haul. These nimble athletes have almost no natural fear of humans anymore, and they've developed astonishing skills. The sheer face climbers rise to the challenge. After all, there's always a reward at the end. Their raids are well planned. They quickly fan out, wasting little time. It takes a mere half an hour for the whole mission. 
Researcher Esme concludes that stealing food is definitely worth it. One small bag of rice alone saves a monkey several arduous hours of foraging in the wild. With his weapon hidden in a bag, Mark Duffel reaches his destination, a restaurant located between the coast and the mountains in the middle of the Smiths gang's territory, a favorite tourist rendezvous. Mark checks the precincts. He knows that the food will lure one individual with particularly sharp instincts. His sensitive nostrils can detect grilled food from three kilometers away. Mark is on the alert. He tries to keep the rogue at bay. Around midday, Merlin catches sight of the laden tables. No one knows when and where he will strike. The baboons have a different tactic every day. Baboons, uh, baboons are extremely clever animals in that. Um, that every day is a new day for a baboon, and every day is a new something, new something else. In that, and they will work out, they will work it out until they get it right. Behind the restaurant, a situation is brewing. The manager is nervous, and for good reason. Merlin is already on the premises. The calm is deceptive. The monkey is interested in the easy to reach leftovers. No one disturbs him. Mark is too late. Merlin has found a place near the restaurant to stash his booty. The little ones learn fast. The boss eats first. Deftly, the big male scoops out the best part of the butternut squash. Rule number one for baboons, you don't share your takings. The rest of the gang only gets a chance when the chief has had enough. Merlin dines a little way from the restaurant. The gang is safe from Mark here, a sort of gentleman's agreement. Now it's Merlin's favorite female's turn. The mother with the baby eats the rest of the spoils. But she finds the curious onlookers much too pushy. Mark's wife, Norma, is impressed. She knows her next door neighbors. The animals are all familiar to her, and she has an individual story about each one. Good boys. Peanuts. Wow. Norma believes the baboons know her personally too. They leave her in peace now that she's highly pregnant, but also because she is the mate of the big man with the gun. Even Fred the car burglar respects her. Merlin's gang moves on, for now. The mountain vegetation here is richly varied. 
Feinbos is only found in South Africa. It's a unique mix of heather and herbaceous bush. The baboons play an important role here. On their long treks, they carry plant and flower seeds in their fur, distributing them widely. The little heaps they leave behind when they dig are vital for the local habitat. Seeds blown by the wind collect and germinate here, giving rise to new plants. The baboons live off over a hundred species of grasses and leaves, but also eat beetles and worms. They're typical omnivores. Baboons are not the only attractions around Table Mountain, of course. Ostriches use the dunes to sunbathe. And the graceful elant is the largest animal in the nature reserve. They all have no natural enemies. The big predators have all long since disappeared. Baboons have benefited from the protection of this habitat as much as all the other animal species. Their numbers are gradually increasing in this new national park. The park is unusually rich in species of flora and fauna. The landscape is diverse, with mountainous plateaus, steep cliffs, sandy dunes and wild, rocky coastal stretches. Despite hundreds of thousands of visitors a year, the 60-kilometer-long Cape Peninsula has retained its romantic beauty. Bontebok and cormorants live as they always have, undisturbed. But this nature idyll is obviously not enough for some inhabitants. The Smiths gang knows where they can come by easy pickings. This time they've got the Happy Valley settlement in their sights. And they're eagerly awaited. They're here, they're there they are. They're up here, come, come, they're here. For the homeless who live in the shelter, their wild neighbors are a welcome diversion. They're pampered and petted. Many residents feel sorry for the droll creatures. All these baboons are hungry. That is the problem. And of course, they, they breed like every minute. When you see there's a new baby, that's nature. So. Somewhere, someone has got to do something about the situation. Researcher Esme Beamish knows many of the problems with the baboons have their roots here. People attract the animals deliberately with fruit and bread. And the monkeys are only too happy to come calling at such a plentiful source of free offerings. The little ones learn from their parents. Where you find people, you'll get something for nothing. Fast, tasty, and easy. This makes them lose their inborn fear of humans very early on. Please don't feed the baboons. It's, it's illegal. We can actually fine you for that. And they don't need any food. These animals actually look really well fed. They're quite, they're quite well fed. But there's covered. nothing up in the mountains. There's plenty of for food them. for them. There's plenty of food. When humans share their food with monkeys, they lose esteem in the monkeys' eyes. If you give away food willingly, you must be at the bottom of the hierarchical ranking. As a result, the baboons no longer take human beings seriously. They become dangerous, you know, and unfortunately those animals will get shot. And I think people need to know that. They think, they think they're doing the baboon a favor feeding it, but actually uh, you're really signing the death warrant. They will get shot in time. 
In the zoological department of the University of Cape Town, Esme evaluates her observations. She counts the victims of car accidents, illegal shootings and poisonings. Dogs also injure and kill baboons. Some of them have also lost limbs as a result of electric shocks from uninsulated masts. Where humans and baboons converge, there is always a price to be paid. However, thanks to their access to fast food, the baboons are breeding faster. There are victims on both sides. Anyone not wishing to share with the baboons will quickly feel their displeasure. The canine teeth of an adult male baboon are longer than those of a lion. The demands that something be done about the pests are getting louder. One casualty of the Smiths gang is Huey Hutchinson. In the past few years, the monkeys of Smithswinkle Bay have become increasingly cheeky, especially bad boy Jimmy. He has repeatedly caused havoc in the remotely situated bungalow. I'm quite happy with them up the mountain, catching scorpions and lizards and, and eating at the fine boss. I'm quite happy with that, but not in my house, thank you. I mean, they walk in and they de demand bacon, and could they have it crispy, please? No, that's out. <laughs> The houses along the coast are often not very secure. Huey leaves his doors and windows open too, an invitation for a hungry, spoiled baboon. Before Table Mountain National Park and the baboons were placed under such strict protection laws, hunters were hired to stop the marauding gangs. In essence, he used to shoot one baboon a year. Um, he would do it in the open, he would do it in front of the whole troop. The, the rifle was unsilenced, it was a, a .22 rifle. The bullet cost about 20 cents and you would not see the troop of baboons after that for between 8 and 18 months. In the same way that we manage criminals, um, we must manage these baboons. I don't want criminals living with me, I don't want the baboons living with me. There are enough conflicts with animal neighbours. Penguin problems, for instance. In Simonstown, near Cape Town, an alliance of wild creatures seems to have virtually taken over. If it's not the baboons coming down from the mountain on lightning raids, it's the penguins coming up from the beach, digging up people's front lawns and creating a hazard on the roads. The squatters waddle down to the shore for a swim, closely observed by the dussies. It's only in the past 30 years that African penguins have settled here. A 
Around 4,000 of these comic-looking birds inhabit the beaches in this suburb. It's their refuge and nesting place, and they defend it vigorously. The waters of False Bay obviously provide them with plentiful supplies of fish and apparently also protection from seals and sharks. Only these lithe swimmers can negotiate the rocks in the stormy waves. The flightless birds are at their safest when near humans. But only the baboons have their own wardens. The town council has recruited 60 men from a local squatter camp to work as so-called monitors for eight different baboon groups. Their job is to keep humans and baboons apart. Their intervening action keeps conflicts to a minimum. Monitor Oswald Bongani is looking for Fred, the infamous car burglar. From morning to evening, the gang has a team of three men on their heels. They only carry walkie-talkies and sticks. They're not allowed to use weapons. Baboons are very smart, so as a monitor, you've got to establish your relationship with that baboon and that baboon troop. And the way you do it is you, you deal with the males, the alpha male, and you make sure that he knows that you're the boss. Well, that's the theory. In reality, it's hard work, a test of metal. This time it worked. With determination and persistence, the monitors have succeeded in reducing the attacks on the settlements by 80%. Since then, the Smiths gang has been on the road more and is now approaching the restaurant where Mark has taken up his post with his air gun. Yeah, I know, but I, I, can't, I can't leave the floor yet, OK? The baboon monitors coordinate their actions. Mark senses there's something up he secures the rear side of the kitchen. At lunchtime, the aromas from the cooking pots are especially enticing, and the heat forces the staff to open the windows. Where is the restaurant's weak spot, and how to avoid Mark? He can't be everywhere, and the robber finds his way in. It's the burgling expert, Jimmy. Missed. The big male retreats, but only a mere stone's throw away. I really have to be one step ahead of them in order to get a good shot at them. I mean, if I'm not within 15 meters, um, they will matrix their way out of a shot. They can see that shot coming with the, with the pellet and they will duck it. Jimmy will take almost any risk for sweet things. As a youngster, he was spoiled by humans who gave him bread and sugar. Many monkeys suffer from poor nutrition. They get fat and have bad teeth. Accident or poisoning victims, or animals that have been put to sleep, land up here in the laboratory. 
This young male was run over by a car. Esme Beamish gathers data that will help reveal the animal's age, state of health, and rank. The more she knows about dead baboons, the better she hopes to be able to understand the ones left behind in the wild. Their hair contains genetic material. An analysis of the samples clearly illustrates the relationships between the members of the troop. The corpses are preserved and stored in cold storage for future examination. Around 30 kilometers away from the center of Cape Town and the university, someone is preparing a major coup. Merlin is hungry, and the baboon monitors have taken up their positions at the restaurant. But yet again, the monkey is faster. Despite all the commotion, the diners find the baboons quite entertaining. They have no idea that Merlin's attack might have been a diverting tactic. Mark is uneasy about the troop of baboons surrounding the restaurant. He has no real overview of the situation, so there's only one solution. Shots fired in the air seem to have an effect. And just for good measure, he follows it up with another. The gunman explains what's going on. Some guests are nervous. Armed gunmen aren't exactly an everyday sight in a restaurant. All right. Uh, hi, is everybody okay here? Yes. Okay. Oh, we had a baboon across the table. I don't think you were here, but I mean... Um, Mark chases off the baboons, but it's for their own safety. He likes baboons and happily talks to the guests about them and their habits and behavior. Just don't feed them is the message to the diners. He explains the strategy behind the consistent deterrence and gives them tips on how to behave if attacked. They the decoy and the cannon fodder. Uh, if it's cool drink uh, with a lot of sugar in, they like fizzy drinks in it. They don't like alcohol beverages. <laughs> yeah. okay. All right. There's no question, this restaurant on the edge of the nature reserve is a special one. Several people come just to experience the baboons up close. However, the baboons have disappeared for the time being. Merlin leads his gang down to the rocks. The Smiths gang is one of the few baboon families which has extended its diet to include an unusual delicacy. At the seashore, there's a delicious, protein-rich food to be found that they can't get up the mountain. The Smiths gang members have learned how to open shellfish. They break sea snails off the rocks and suck out the flesh.
They go for mussels too. Using their strong fingers, they prise the shellfish off their firm anchorage and bite them open with their teeth. The young monkeys learn by copying their elders. Merlin is obviously not averse to eating something that's not served up on a plate. While the tide is out, the baboons eat their fill of seafood. Then they digest in peace. After about an hour, they move on. On their way from the seashore to the mountain, the monkeys encounter the outposts of civilization once again. While the young monkeys play, the older ones have a different game up their sleeve. The baboon monitors are on the alert. The Smiths gang have reached their new target area. It's a favorite scenic drive, the coastal road from Cape Town to Cape Point. The monitors have a hard job ahead of them. They know the ritual only too well. The baboons have their tactics down to a T. In the heat of the day, members of the gang squat on the road or meander across it, blocking the traffic. Tens of thousands of tourists fall for this hijacking trick every year. They seem harmless and look cute. Most people don't stay on the bus. They get out of their vehicle to get close-up snapshots. The gang leaders and their clan pose seductively. They'll use any diversion to attract attention. Don't get too close. I'm so okay. cute. And it works. For the national park, they're an essential attraction. Visitors often come especially to see the monkeys at play. Fred strikes. Using the distraction, he approaches the abandoned vehicles and goes looking for food. Mark reacts. He's had a report from the monitors that the bandits are about a kilometer away and has put up signs. True to its nickname, the Cape of Storms makes his efforts look a bit like tilting at windmills. Mark does everything he can to warn tourists about the long-fingered proclivities of their popular photo models. But many people simply don't believe what a baboon like Fred the Alpha male is capable of. Internationally recognized signs are meant to make the car thieves' job more difficult. Fred observes the negligent tourists closely. Bad luck for Fred. Thanks to the baboon monitor's advice, several car owners have locked their vehicles. But keeping an eye out on all fronts is no easy job for Oswald Bongani. Sometimes they don't understand English. When you talk English, they, they speak Russian or whatever. So, complication. There's a communication breakdown. Sometimes you tell them to close the door, just come out with a big jacket. Said, no, close the door, but it's very fun, very fun for you, you see. So it's very hard to control tourists. 
And Fred knows exactly how to use these communication problems to his own advantage. Once the thief is inside the car, there's little the monitors can do to get rid of him. Fred sorts through his takings in the bush. At least mobile phones and wallets don't interest him. The bag-snatching maestro is closely watched and copied by the juveniles. Once a troop has learned something, it's passed on and refined. It's only a matter of time until the younger monkeys will be able to open doors. They're looking for bags that they can ransack and for the gap they can use to get into the car. Ah! The little ones practice under Fred's watchful eye. The fact that they haven't quite got it yet gives the researchers hope. If we can implement certain things, then we can at least stop the, young, the younger animals from learning the bad habits. And that's what our aim is. The older animals, you're not going to take the, beha the behavior out of them, but we're hoping to, at least the younger ones won't be confident um, and, and habitual raiding animals. And then that's our big hope. That's our aim, our long-term aim. Fred is still the ace car thief. He's going straight to Marta, the, uh, going to raid at the Black Marlin. The baboon monitors are powerless, and the researcher comforts the victims. They'll get their bag back when Fred's finished. Meanwhile, the advice is, don't interfere, it could be dangerous. Fred is irritated, there's not much edible here. And even though he seems to have lost interest, it's his prize and his alone. And he proves it. Just leave it, just leave it, ah, drop it, drop it, drop it! That could have ended badly. In those situations, those baboons um, associate people with food, they associate motor cars with food, they associate people's handbags with food. And if you try and take that food away from them, they're going to challenge you for it. Now those baboons are very difficult for the monitors just to deal with unless they've got any other uh, means of chasing them away. The young baboons have no fear either, and the monitors wish they had tasers to protect themselves and to help chase the baboons back into the mountains for good. Further up the plateau, there are, of course, baboons that can live peacefully with humans. Their presence is happily tolerated in the forestry plantations. And even though they also come close to settlements, they have not lost their respect for humans. Esme hopes that it will stay that way. The peaceful baboons come across a paddock and their playful instincts take over. But the four-legged and two-legged creatures have no problems with each other. They happily coexist if no one feeds the monkeys. They are happy just to satisfy their curiosity.
Elsewhere on the mountain range, the nature idyll is deceptive. This protea is not only a target for sunbirds. Merlin finds the South African national flower pretty tasty too. Planted around the restaurant, they're an added attraction for the baboons and a challenge for their opponents. Merlin respects Mark, or rather his weapon. The hairy hoodlum retreats. Mark knows he has to make the entire restaurant baboon-proof, or it's going to be a long, drawn-out combat. So they get down to it. The windows may only be opened a crack, so no more Merlins can slip in. The restaurant manager has already lost several thousand euro from the attacks. Mark has a simple but effective solution for the kitchen too. It's not going to be so easy for Merlin here either. The restaurant is starting to look a bit like a fortress. The defences are going to be inspected. A commission is on the way. Esme Beamish and an envoy from the local council note the developments. Let's see his route. Mark explains the new door handle, which is supposed to make it more difficult for the bandits to get in. Like this. Turn the handle and pull, OK? You can see he's leaning against it so it doesn't open, but if it opened inwards... It would open. Yeah, then it would open easily. You see his weight would just push it open when you've got it right. Look, you can see his fingerprints on the window. You can see his fingerprints on the window. That's Jimmy Pruill. And so what is he getting there? Is that fish or chips or starch or protein or anything hot? He takes the chips, he takes the... Um, I don't know, what he actually grabbed in that? Vegetables, like, probably. Vegetables, grabs the, um, the bread is there as well. Bread, yeah. yeah. grabs a loaf of bread on the way out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's what Merlin and Force were doing. They were sitting here knocking on the door. <laughs> That is unbelievable. And the door opened. And you didn't and ask who opened. I was. <laughs> <laughs> the but it, yeah. I took the circlip off the back of the lock he and dropped it down, 90, dropped it down yeah. 90 degrees. You have to turn it and pull yeah, it. Cool. Yeah, that, that'll Which confuse is, him for a bit. <laughs> it yeah. seems like baboons have a lot a of problems crossing over. <laughs> <laughs> the odd success, perhaps, but the problem remains. Mark has made the building more secure now, but the coffee bar outside is still open and vulnerable to attack, and Merlin uses it for his next raid. Hey! A guest defends himself, and a dangerous situation develops. Merlin is not afraid of anyone, except Mark and his gun. And this time he got Merlin, but still. A baboon is a con artist of the world and that, so he will con me thinking that I, into thinking that I've got the upper hand, but in the meantime, he's no, he knows exactly what's going on in that. I mean, I think now they're up at the top there in their caves discussing what's going, the events of the day and planning the strategy for tomorrow. Merlin and Fred lead their troop back up to the rocks. Thanks to Mark, 
the number of attacks by the baboons has gone down. They've learned that their raids are associated with risks. If monitors like Mark manage to keep the baboons consistently in check, there is definitely a chance for peaceful coexistence for baboons and humans. We had a very happy understanding. I mean, I lived there and the baboons lived there. We, we respected each other's space. Um, this is my territory, that's your territory, that's fine. I don't mind if you walk past my door, and that, that's, that's fine. But don't come and steal from me, you know, that's my territory. Don't come onto my territory. Likewise, I won't go and like, caress you when you like, just around there. The future of the Smiths gang is uncertain. Fred, Jimmy and Merlin's offspring will decide their fate. If these young baboons do not lose respect for humans, and if people allow them to remain wild animals, neither spoiling them nor bringing them up as city dwellers, then, and only then, will the baboons be able to continue inhabiting the Table Mountain Massif, almost as they have done for millennia here in the Cape.